Is there a topic in our world today more divisive or likely to rile someone up than politics? Probably not. I want to warn you, though, that in the next several minutes, I'm about to get very political. <laughs> but in the best possible way, in the most encouraging way, in a way that's not divisive, but actually unites us under the king of all the universe, Jesus Christ. You may battle anxiety as you think about politics, specifically about the election that is right around the corner, and I certainly do as well. But I want to open up a passage of scripture that's been especially encouraging in helping me battle my sinful anxiety as it relates to politics. Now don't get me wrong, it's good for Christians to be engaged in politics and to care about it. Um, it politics impacts us, it impacts our neighbors, and voting for good candidates and being politically engaged is one way to love our neighbor. But our anxiety and concern can move us away from trust in God and move us toward a sinful type of anxiety. And so that's what I'm really focusing on in this message. And I'm going to steer clear from the specifics of 2024 for a couple reasons. One is that many of us are inundated by talk of politics and policies and polls and politicians. And I think we could use a break. <laughs> I certainly could. Uh, secondly, I want us to think about all of history and not just the present day. The truth that we're going to see in the next few moments is a life-changing truth and was for ancient Israel when they first received this text. It was a life-changing truth for Christians uh, from the ancient Roman Empire, Christians today who are persecuted in places like China and Iran, and life-changing truth for every other believer to ever live. And more specifically, I want this YouTube video to live on past this election season in 2024 when I'm uploading it. And I want this video to encourage people 5, 10, 15 years uh, into the future and beyond. So if you're watching this video, leave a comment, uh, share the year uh, that you're watching this video and your location uh, from around the world. And I love this comment section to be one that praises Jesus from all over the world throughout the rest of history. Let me encourage you now to open your Bible to the second psalm. Psalm 2 was written by King David about 3,000 years ago. One famous pastor said that if he had the opportunity to speak at the presidential prayer breakfast, he would choose the second psalm as his text. I want to invite you to imagine with me that you're in a big thunderstorm in the mountains. Uh, it's a it's dark at night, and you see lightning light up the entire sky, and uh, you hear a booming thunderclap that echoes from left to right off the mountains, and it's an incredible experience that gives you the chills. That's kind of how I think about Psalm 2, and the truth Psalm 2 proclaims, because uh, Psalm 2 proclaims glorious truths about the Lord Jesus Christ and politics that echo throughout the history of the world with thunderous authority. These truths run from David's time, when it was written to the time of the Lord Jesus and his apostles, through the modern day, all the way through the end of the book of Revelation. And as we look at this psalm, my prayer is that God would help us see the glory of King Jesus and how participating in his kingdom is the greatest thing we could ever imagine, uh, especially against the backdrop of our current political moment. And in this message, we're going to walk through the psalm in three parts, and then we're going to look at three applications for us. Let's start with the first part of Psalm 2, uh, the first three verses, which I'll call the world's problem. These first three verses address, as we'll see, what's a major problem in the world. Psalm 2, verse 1. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. We see today's headlines here, don't we? The nations are raging. The peoples are plotting. The kings of the earth are conspiring together, not just in a general sense, but specifically against the Lord and his anointed, against God, saying, we don't need the bonds and cords of his law in our lives, or put it another way, the Bible's too restrictive for the lives that we want to live. Today we see hatred of God, hatred toward the things of God, toward the people of God, toward the design of God. We see power-hungry leaders acting to prop up their own egos with total disregard to the millions they're supposed to serve. We see wars and 
rumors of wars and rumors of nuclear wars, which is something kind of scary to think about, especially as you think about some of the nations and leaders that are out there. But these, th these first three verses in Psalm 2 help me set my expectations for the rest of history on this earth. That means until Christ comes, the nations will continue to rage, and many people, including world leaders, sometimes even our own, will oppose God. Or to put it another way, we're still going to have issues in our lives and in our current political climate until Christ returns. And that, that's true even if your guy wins the upcoming election. And to drill even deeper on applying this point, if the nations and her leaders continue to rage, then our listening to political news and commentary 24-7 isn't going to help solve any problems, the world's problems or our problems. Yes, we need to be informed. I'm not saying don't be informed. I'm not saying don't care about your country, don't care about your neighbor, because politics, as I said, impacts each one of us. But what I am saying is that an overconsumption of political news may make you more anxious and may take you away from the will of God for your life. So that's the world's problem. First part of Psalm 2. Now let's turn to God's response. We see that in verses 4 through 9, the next two stanzas of the psalm. What is God's response going to be to the raging of the nations and the rebellious world leaders? This is an important question for us as we think about the politics of our day. As we think about maybe especially the politicians we don't like in our day. How does God think about it? Is he up in heaven wringing his hands, you know, looking around, asking the angels, what should I do? I don't know. No. Let's look at verse 4 together. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Verse 5, then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. God is saying here, I have my own king. <laughs> and in verses 7 through 9, the king, who is the Messiah, Jesus Christ, speaks, quoting God the Father. Verse 7, I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. The concerning headlines and evil people making the headlines don't worry God in the slightest. He laughs and he holds them in derision. The nations and world leaders trying to rebel against God are like a four-year-old trying to swing punches at a full-grown man. The man can maybe just put his uh, hand on the kid's head and the kid's going to be swinging his arms uh, powerless to do anything against such great power and strength. Uh, it's really a laughable image. This is laughable for God because he has sovereign control over the universe. But what's interesting is that when we have faith in who God says he is, it's also laughable for us. Scripture is filled with great illustrations of God's sovereignty over the nations and their leaders. Think of Pharaoh in the book of Exodus. This is the most powerful man in the world at the time in the most powerful nation of the world. He was brought to his knees by the God of his slaves. Think of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon that we read about in Daniel chapter 4. Because he wouldn't acknowledge God, he went crazy. He became like a wild beast who ate grass in the fields until he acknowledged that God's dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. Isaiah 40 says the nations are like a drop in the bucket before God. Another example we see in scriptures is King Herod and Pontius Pilate, two governmental leaders who played a part in crucifying Jesus Christ, God's chosen king. But God had a plan for their rebellion. God had a plan for the cross. Ephesians 1 says that God works all things according to the counsel of his will. Nothing is outside of God's sovereign purposes for the world, not even raging nations and their leaders, not even the death of his son and chosen king 
that we read about here in Psalm 2. Part of the reason why God can laugh, as we've been seeing, is that God has his own king, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He will not only reign over the world in sovereign power, he will judge the rebellious nations by breaking them with a rod of iron and dashing them into pieces like a potter's vessel, as verse 9 says. That's a really striking picture. No pun intended. Many think of Jesus as meek and mild. He's a soft guy made with a baby lamb around his shoulders. And certainly uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is as loving and as welcoming as we could ever imagine. But there's more to Jesus than just that picture. Here it says that Jesus Christ will judge the nations and will smash them to pieces with a rod of iron. So as we consider God's response to the political turmoil and evil leaders of the world, my charge to you is to not let politics suffocate your faith. The raging nations and rebellious leaders will one day be Jesus' pinata as he ushers in his perfect reign on earth. Because he has a firm grasp on the steering wheel of history, we can hope in him beyond the headlines. What's cool about this psalm is that according to this psalm, today's political leaders can too. That brings us to the psalm's last three verses, 10 through 12. And this is where uh, David shares how humanity should respond. And I almost titled this section, Humanity's Response. But the truth is not every human will respond to this truth in the way that God wants. But here is what God wants. Verse 10, he addresses the kings and leaders of the earth. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. God is giving a gracious warning here of coming judgment to world leaders. And what does he say? Verse 11, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, that means to pay homage, to bend the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ with all of your life. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. And oh, I love how this psalm ends. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. This is a pretty amazing surprise if you think about it. God offers grace to those who rebel against him. The psalm primarily addresses the rulers of the nations, but the rest of the Bible makes it very clear <laughs> that we, each one of us, have rebelled against God too. This is grace that we all need. There is a way to escape being dashed to pieces like a piece of pottery, and that is by taking refuge in the Lord Jesus Christ by faith. We take refuge in him, and we can take refuge in him because of the cross. At the cross, God's Son took God the Father's wrath upon himself. He He took took our punishment. punishment. When When we believe in him, we we take take refuge in his saving work and we can avoid this judgment and be reconciled to God and be called his dearly loved children and friends instead of his enemies. We respond to this offer in faith. This is why the one preacher I mentioned a few moments ago at the beginning said that he would choose Psalm 2 for a presidential prayer breakfast because Psalm 2 calls leaders and calls everyone from every nation to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and repentance. Blessed are all who take refuge in God's eternal King, the Lord Jesus Christ. And before we move on to applications, I just want to take a minute And think about the eternal kingdom of our great King and Savior. We know that our world is filled with sin, filled with injustice, filled with so much anger, especially as we think about the politics of our day. The good things one leader does can be erased by the person who follows him so quickly. But take heart, brothers and sisters, that Christ's kingdom in the new heavens and the new earth is one of perfection for all of eternity. There will be perfect justice. There will be perfect love. We will enjoy perfect fellowship with God. 
No one will undo what he decrees, and in a world of empty campaign promises, Jesus keeps all of his promises to us. And guess what? His promises are beyond our wildest imagination. In Revelation 21, John writes that there will be no more tears, no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, nor pain anymore. Well, I could say more about the glory of Christ's perfect kingdom. I'm going to let the Apostle Paul have the final word in 1 Corinthians 2.9. He says, No eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor human mind has conceived the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Oh, brothers and sisters, I can't wait for that day. So we've walked through Psalm 2, and now we're going to see three applications to help us live out Psalm 2, especially as we think about our political anxiety. So the first application is to let Psalm 2 inspire you to rejoice in God's sovereignty and justice. Remember, God laughs because he has set his king on the throne of the universe. Jesus Christ is reigning today in 2024 and whatever year you're watching this video. His rule isn't challenged by term limits, by opposing parties, or by voter fraud. He's the eternal king with all authority in heaven and on earth. Current turmoil doesn't surprise him. The book of Revelation teaches us that Christ is on his throne through the famines, the wars, the plagues, and the revolutions of world history. It was the same for the first two world wars and will be the same if a third ever breaks out. We know that all wrongs will be made right. We know that all guilty will be held to account by our righteous judge and savior. And we know that all who take refuge in him by faith are on the right side of history forever. So rejoice in his sovereignty and his perfect justice. Second application point. Let Psalm 2 challenge you to pray for the conversion of world leaders. According to Psalm 2, every politician who makes your blood boil can escape Jesus' wrath by bowing before him in humble faith. Yes, God will judge the world. But don't forget that God is also merciful. He desires all men to be saved. In 1 Timothy 2, he calls us to pray for the salvation of kings and all who are in high positions. While many world leaders will continue to rebel against the Lord, some will heed God's warning and will take refuge in Christ. My question for you, do you pray for the conversion of world leaders as if it were possible? Don't forget that with God, all things are possible. Why would God offer this command in 1 Timothy 2 if he didn't plan to answer our prayers and save some. Brothers and sisters, what a glorious thing it would be to see world leaders like Donald Trump and Kamala Harris and Naib Bukele and Kim Jong-un and Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin worshiping King Jesus with saints from every tribe and tongue and nation in heaven. Think of the eternal difference that you can make by praying for political leaders more than you complain about them. And as the political temperature rises around us, let our prayers rise as well. Lastly, let Psalm 2 motivate you to tell others about the true king. In our world, there are so many people longing for a true identity, for a true refuge, longing for true hope, trying to satisfy their longings in all the wrong places. And many seek all of these longings in politics and political leaders. But we find all of this and so much more in Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 4, some of the Jerusalem leaders told John and Peter to stop preaching about Jesus. When they got back together with the other believers, they began to pray. And they launched their prayer, surprisingly enough, with the opening words of the psalm we're looking at, Psalm 2. And they referred to the nations raging and the leaders opposed to God and his Christ, because that's what just happened uh, in Jerusalem. But where did their prayer go after opening it with Psalm 2? You may find this interesting. I love this. They prayed for boldness to proclaim the message of Jesus. Instead of thinking defensively, 
How do we protect ourselves from persecution and hardship? They thought offensively. How can we be more bold in proclaiming God's son and his kingdom to this lost world? (laughs) Basically, they said, you told us not to preach Jesus. We're going to preach Jesus even harder. (laughs) Their understanding of who Jesus is motivated them for mission. Brothers and sisters, it can do the same for us. I want to ask you a question. Have you ever been discouraged in evangelism thinking that some people are impossible to reach? Oh, so-and-so has heard the gospel so many times that they'll never trust in Christ. They've rejected him for so many years. I think a lot of us have had thoughts like that. And I also think that that is how the devil wants us to think. Have you ever thought about it this way? Yes, a certain person may have rejected Jesus Christ for decades upon decades and may have heard the gospel countless times, but what if the decades haven't been that kind to them? What if they tried life under their own lordship and they're tired of the life that that means for them? They're tired of longing for more, longing for truth, longing for real substance. Maybe they're actually more open to Jesus Christ after these years. Let me share a brief story that illustrates how the kingdom of God advances in surprising ways. And this story is about a missionary to the Congo named Maud Kells uh, from last century. Uh, she had unbelieving parents who opposed her desire to leave uh, Ireland, that was her home country, to serve as a nurse in the Congo, the country in Africa. And even though they opposed her desire to do that, she went anyway. And she ministered for a few years in Congo and was really getting traction in relationships and language learning and uh, in her ministry, gaining valuable experience. And the Lord was really blessing her efforts. Then one day, a letter came for her, from her father. And he pleaded for her to come home and serve as her mom's nurse while she lived out the final months of her life. It was a heart-wrenching decision for Maud Kells. She would have to give up her new home and so much of the progress she was making in ministry to serve her mother who had opposed her ministry and some of her life decisions and didn't believe in her Savior. But she did go and she followed God's call to serve her mother. And over the next few months as she cared for her mom, just about daily she was able to open God's word with her and pray with her. She was able to share what Jesus meant to her and Amazingly enough, her mom came to faith before her death because of her daughter's testimony and ministry to her. Fast forward a few years, and almost the same exact situation played out with her father. He was her biggest critic. And one day she read to him the 23rd Psalm and asked him, Wouldn't you like to know Jesus as your personal shepherd? And her father, as he lay there, you know, the father, the same man who had held out for so long, didn't want to believe in Jesus Christ, he said, yes, I would like to receive Christ. This woman faithfully proclaimed Jesus to people who didn't want to hear it. And she loved them, she persevered, and God showed them grace. And they came to faith. Brothers and sisters, there are people in our lives who need to take refuge in Jesus. People caught up in the drama of our culture and politics and often people who don't think at all about eternity. But how great is it for us to have hope beyond the current state of politics? How great is it for us to take refuge in our King and Savior and Shepherd, Jesus Christ, who loves us? We can let our current political climate motivate us to share better news than what people constantly see scrolling on their phones. This is the best news ever imaginable of a God who would send his son to die for humanity to make us his beloved children forever. Brothers and sisters, these days of distress and political anxiety might present our greatest opportunity to exalt the king of kings in our world desperate for hope. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the thunderous authority of the Lord Jesus Christ that echoes throughout the history of the world, Lord, and into the future. Father, kings and nations, regimes and political parties, Lord, come and go. They've gone, come and gone so much throughout world history. 
But Jesus remains on his throne and his kingdom advances and not even the gates of hell can stop it. Lord, we worship you. Lord, we long for Jesus Christ to come and usher in his kingdom in perfection on this earth. Lord, as we think about the things in current politics that make us anxious, Lord, that make us angry, Lord, as we think about the things that tempt us to only think about this world and what we can see, Lord, would you lift our eyes to the eternal? Lord, would you help us set our hearts and our minds fully on the hope to be given us when Jesus Christ is revealed? Lord, and help that hope motivate us today to mission, Lord, to do what we can do to expand the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, fill us with peace as we think about the Prince of Peace. And Lord, how he is building his church and advancing in the world. Lord, even when there are some major problems that we face every day, help us not think that this earth is our home. Lord, we thank you for the promises of heaven. We ask that you would strengthen our faith, increase our hope and our love for you and for others until Jesus returns. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for sticking around. Uh, this long in the video. If you like this content, give this video a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and if you know a friend or a loved one who might appreciate this message on Psalm 2, please send it to them. Additionally, you're going to want to check out the description of this video. I've shared a few other resources to help you fight political anxiety with biblical truth, and one is a playlist of worship songs based on the truths of Psalm 2. It's been fun for me to put together and really blessed my soul to think about King Jesus, and I hope it encourages you as well. May God bless you as you take refuge in his King.